Hey, Maria, thanks so much for doing this. I'm really excited to go back through um, your experience building Agora in a way that you know can help our audience figure out what they want to do and, and what they want to build. So I thought since we only have 15 minutes, I'd just start with a really quick um, you know, question around <laughs> you laughing. No, I'm laughing. Yeah, no, it's good. Yeah. Start, start with defining our rules of engagement. That's good. OK. Uh, no, I, I basically want to understand, you know, you, you had a really interesting background, obviously having come from Oxford and then being president of the Oxford Union and then Goldman Sachs, where you, know, you were part of this like, very established um, and establishment route of excellence. And then you decided the last minute to pivot uh, into Silicon Valley and ultimately start a company. So I just thought it would be interesting to hear what motivated you to come out to Silicon Valley? And, you know, it doesn't sound like you'd really been setting yourself up to start a company prior to that. No, well, what motivated me, Anthony, was you. Uh, for everyone listening, Anthony is actually the man that convinced me to move to San Francisco. So that's a very short answer. The slightly longer answer is, you know, especially, I mean, in Europe and especially at Oxford when I was there, starting a company just wasn't an option. I didn't know anyone that had done it. It wasn't something people talked about. And so when I came out of university, I sort of thought to myself, well, you know, banking sounds like a reasonable route, let's do it. But I never had any passion for it. And when I was doing it, you know, I was working these insane hours, <laughs> like I wasn't sleeping and I just didn't feel that engaged with it. But when I was in San Francisco for a summer and Anthony introduced me to Joe, who, you know, which just, just it, my mind was blown about how, at such a young age, you can be given so much responsibility and you could focus on problems that you were really passionate about and you could think about truly how do you make the world a better place. And so I think for me, starting a company started with coming to San Francisco and just seeing that energy, getting into venture, seeing how people were just solving really awesome problems for the world and then thinking I wanted to take on that challenge myself. And tell me about that, because obviously, as a venture capitalist, you have the opportunity to invest in a lot of the solutions that sound like they were exciting you. What convinced you that it was time for you to you know, try your hand at building something yourself? You know, I so I always focused on how to make an impact, right? I, there's, there's this concept in Judaism called tikkun olam, which essentially talks about how do you leave the world in a better place than how you found it? And in thinking about that, Originally, I always thought you do that through politics, right? Or you do that through journalism or through policy. And being a venture capitalist, I realized actually, you can do that bottom up. And you can do that in a way where you don't need to solve all problems, but you can focus on solving one particular problem, really, really understand it, like truly be the world expert at one particular thing, and then solve that. And the thing is though, I was like, I wanna start a company, I'm ready to do this, like this is what I wanna do but I actually had no idea what that company would be. So I decided I just needed to do it, right? Like you just kind of need to jump off the cliff and then try to build the plane before the plane crashes at the bottom. I, I so, think a lot of people talk about that, but I mean, you were Joe's chief of staff, you know, billion dollar, multi-billion dollar venture fund, you know, one of the luminaries of our time in our industry. And then you said, okay, well, you know, today's the day I'm going to go start a company. And we were like, okay, Maria, what's the company going to start? You said, well, ask me that in a couple of months. And like, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I know that you've been considering it. What made you decide, okay, I need to set aside space and time in my life to figure out what company I'm going to start, not whether I'm going to start a company. I, th I think I was really thinking about the impact that I wanted to make and the kind of growth that I wanted to have, right? Like I didn't want to be an investor. Like I like investing. I think it's really intellectually interesting to think about companies and analyze them, but I knew that I wanted to be a builder. Like I knew that I wanted to be someone that day to day was actually a must in that subject matter. And a lot of that comes back to that experience that I described at Goldman where, right? Like I just kind of felt like, I just wasn't that passionate about what I was doing. Um, and, and in trying to figure out what to do, like, you know, I've always been fascinated by cities and low key, my dream is to build a city. And so I knew that, right, like the problem space that I wanted to operate in, I knew what that was, but I didn't really know what specific problem to address or how viable the problems even were. Um, and that's really when I was like, well, the intellectually honest way to approach this is to acknowledge what you don't know and come up with a framework for how it is that you plan to solve those unknowns. And so 
you know, with our very early team, that's essentially what we did. We just spent six months researching what problems were out there that we thought were interesting. And then it was towards the end of those six months that we actually landed on the problem where we knew this was a good company to build and this was the company we were going to build. And how did you, you know, I think this is a pretty fascinating thing because I mean, you're really committing yourself to years and years of work towards a specific problem area or industry. You know, what were the thresholds uh, that determined whether or not an idea was good as you were talking about with your early team? Yeah, well, those thresholds took us a while to develop. <laughs> we definitely didn't have them when we started, but where we landed was, so one was just the size of the market, right? Because investors will always ask how big is the TAM? And it really is the number one question you need to solve because I forget who said this quote, but if the market isn't big enough, it's just really, really hard for you to build a business. And however good an entrepreneur you are, the market always wins. I think it's a Charlie Munger or Warren Buffett quote. It's, I think yeah, I was going to say, I think it might be a Warren Buffett quote, but it's true, right? And so a lot of the ideas that we had, like we wanted to start a water bank for a while. We wanted to start like a company that gave data back to cities to make more informed decisions. But what we realized was that the market for those was just not big enough to build a billion dollar company. The second factor we looked at was just the frequency of transactions, right? Like, what does that market really look like? How does it operate? And that was where we considered how long would selling into this market actually take, right? I was really passionate about doing something tied to city government, but when we realized that it takes sometimes many years to close just one contract, it's really hard to build a business in that environment. And then the third factor we focused on was also what's the competitive landscape? Right. And so some of the ideas we had, I mean, they sounded great, like providing retraining programs to um, people in lower skilled jobs in any given city area. But then we realized, like, actually, that space is incredibly competitive and lots of different players are trying to attack it from different angles. And so that means it's very hard to build. So for us, it was really overall TAM frequency of transaction and fundamentally competition. And so once you narrowed down the problem that you wanted to solve, how did you figure out, because it sounds like you came at it from more of a market or macro perspective. Yeah, how did you figure out what a product could look like that you, you, know, that you could commercialize and scale and, and develop into a high margin SaaS company? Yeah, good question. I mean. I wish someone, I, I'm going to say, I wish someone had told me this when I restarted. And I actually think you told me this when we started, but it really came down to understanding our customs. <laughs> like we had a bunch of wireframes of what we thought a product might look like. You know, we had a bunch of wireframes of what individual people had told us because we spent for those six months we literally reached out to thousands of people on linkedin like we showed up on various job sites and brought donuts we literally took a meeting with anyone who had any title that was tied to construction the built environment city government like we spoke to truly thousands of people and i think when it came to the product what we realized was that you don't build a great product by just going in a dark room with smart people and right, like conjuring what you think it needs to look like. You really just need to get feedback. And so for the first while, we tried the fast approach. And then pretty quickly, we realized actually what we needed to do was just put together a wireframe prototype that looked like it was slightly real. So we used the software called Aksha to do that. And then we just instead of going into meetings and just asking super open-ended questions, we would actually go with this sort of like mini mocked up video and then say to people, would you use this? Would you not use this? And we found that the real way to actually get the product into a state that was usable was purely through getting that customer feedback because so many things, especially when you're thinking about these vertical industries, right? Like construction, which has literally operated for thousands of years without you being there, you need to understand the edge cases. You need to understand how those people do their work. And how did you assess the credibility of their, you know, they're telling you just verbally and casually in a conversation that they needed or they didn't need it? Like, you know, do you ever have any false starts or false negatives? For sure. <laughs> Something we learned is that 
and again, I think this might be a Steve Jobs quote, but it's that sometimes people don't know what they want. Like people would describe to us this really complex view of how they wanted materials ordered that involved all these like hyper complex routing mechanisms. And actually we'd figure out that the thing they really needed was just a much simpler approval chain. So I think for us, we looked at one, like how many people are telling you the same thing? Because if multiple people are saying it, there's likely some kernel of truth there. And then the second thing is we just got people to put their money where their mouth is, right? So we actually asked people, okay, cool. If we build this, would you pay for it? And, you know, a lot of advice that we got in the early days was give your product away for free. Well, we actually tried that and we learned that people were very suspicious of something being given away for free. <clears throat> <laughs> which is also learning that uh, that you may have shared. But that's what we realized that actually the way to approach this was undercharge, right? Charge something that makes the friction of getting to a yes as low as possible and use that to just really optimize for usage. Like get those prototypes into people's hands, get them to tell you where things don't work and then triangulate across as many people as possible. Because a mistake I've seen people make is that they go too narrow in trying to sell these like big marquee accounts, but then they spend way too much time trying to optimize around one marquee account that might actually not have anything in common with the rest of the market. Yeah, we saw that all the time at ABC, actually. That it's one of the big challenges with enterprise software. Uh, so I, I think we, we only have a couple more minutes. I think what would be most interesting for the audience to hear about is, you know, the transition from you know, intellectual business philosopher into <laughs> operator and CEO. You know, tell us a little bit about your early journey and what the key step function changes in your evolution were uh, about. <laughs> but I had such bad imposter syndrome for the longest time. I think you remember this. There was a time when we sat in Anthony's office and he just had to write on a whiteboard, you are smarter than you think, in order for me to actually internalize it. Um, I mean, at the beginning, I was constantly questioning, I think maybe because of the, the philosophy degree, like how do I know that I'm right? And how do I believe that what I think I'm saying is actually the right thing? And why do I even have the right to say what I'm saying? Like I was really, really slowing myself down with a lot of those questions. And I think, I think a few things, I think one is, just coming down to first principles, right? So like taking away the emotion of why am I the person that has these opinions? Are these the right opinions to have? But really just reducing things to like, you are the on person. an absolute, huh? You are the person, you know? Well, <laughs> one, yes, but two is just like reducing things to the base level of like, does this make sense? <laughs> on, on, a, on an absolute level, does what I'm saying make sense? And two was actually starting to just like, I think the more success that we had and the more that we saw customers are actually using the product and customers are telling us that they like the product and it's actually solving a problem for them and really smart people wanted to join the company. Like all of that led me to actually say like, oh, we might be onto something here. And I think for me, again, having friends like you was a huge step in that, but also a really important aspect of it was just in, in the absence of like, an emotional confidence that you are definitely building the right thing and you shouldn't doubt yourself. I was just going back to logic and really focusing on like, if I was to advise a friend on what is the best way to solve a problem, is this a sensible solution? And then actually one thing I'll add is just running tests, right? Knowing that you don't know everything and there's no way that you can, but start small, run a test, validate it, if the test doesn't work out, that's actually a perfectly good outcome because the purpose of test isn't for the test to be right. The purpose of the test is to learn something. So carving out these big questions that we had into little tests was also a, a very good way to get away from that imposter syndrome. And before we wrap up, I just want to say, you know, I think that it, it sounds like what you're saying is that the doubt and that evolution is a normal process of, you know, building a company. And it's, you know, I think in our experience, we saw a lot of people who, you know, thought they want to start a company, start a company, they sat in that doubt for a couple of months, and then they pivoted out of it. So do you feel like that's a natural thing you have to get through to get to where you are now? You know, there might be some people that don't have to go through it, but 
I, I think it actually really is. Like to me, it's really human because look, you're trying to do something that hasn't been done before. That's fundamentally really hard. And you're also working in an industry that has, per my earlier point, like operated totally fine without you for a long time. So how can you come to that and be like, yep, I know everything and I have all questions unsolved. I think some, someone once told me this and, and I really carry it with me, which is that courage is in the absence of fear. Courage is sort of looking at fear and still continuing to move forward. That's and so I think it, <laughs> and so I think that doing that is actually, it's a really normal process, right? Have those doubts, but then figure out a logical bite-sized way to walk through those doubts and get to the answers you want to get to. Cool, Maria. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. It's such a pleasure to relive it with you. No, this was so much fun. Thank you, Anthony.